like to start with the benefits of CI. And basically, this is why I love my job uh, to get started. And hopefully, this will pique your interest for uh, the rest of the slides. One, it's a fantastic career. It's not just a job, a dead end job that you do one thing and you make widgets every day and that's it. Uh, there's so many things that you can do in this position. When you get hired on as a special agent, there's many, many opportunities. Opportunities for travel, there's opportunities for, uh, for becoming an executive and becoming part of the management core. There's opportunities for expert training and uh, being and getting specialized training. Uh, for example, I joined the undercover program. So I got undercover training and I've gone on a couple of undercover assignments, which is a lot of fun where it's just like in the movies, you kind of get mic'd up and video and you go into a business or an environment and uh, it can be a lot of fun, but there's also technical skills that they teach you. You can be part of our uh, computer technical cadre and they will teach you how to extract information from computers and smartphones and different devices. Again, all in our efforts to gather evidence. Uh, so one fantastic career. I, I can't uh, say enough good things about it. I could keep talking about this, why it's a great career for over an hour. Um, second, it's family friendly. Not only is it family friendly, but it's, you're also part of a community, a law enforcement community, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, uh, that people who really care about the community, who want to protect the community, and who want to help the little guy. And if there's been an injustice and you've been ripped off or the government's been ripped off millions of dollars, uh, it's like you know the citizens were ripped off because you pay taxes and that helps the government function. And if the government is embezzled from or defrauded, then they're basically stealing from your pocket. So you really do make a difference in that way. Uh, but back to being family friendly, if you wanna work Monday through Friday, eight to five, eight to six, you can do that. Uh, you don't need to have crazy hours. You can get on a case, uh, particularly a drug case, that runs wires maybe 24 seven, or you might have to do a raid on the weekend or early morning hours. So you do have those occasional uh, weird days, but in general, it's a very family friendly place to work and you can raise a family. Uh, I have two kids. My first uh, child, I took two months off for maternity leave. My second child, I took four months off for maternity leave. Uh, there's opportunities if you wanted to go study or you wanted to take a break because you need to be with your family, you can take as much as a year off for sabbatical. Uh, I was an acting manager for another group at the beginning of the year. And one of the agents in that group, he was a part-time agent. So you know, after five years with my agency, you can apply to be part of the part-time program. And this particular agent, uh, he goes to work two days a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, he came to the office. Uh, that was because his wife had a demanding job and he decided he wanted to stay home and be able to be with their two young children. And he can do that because we have this part-time program, which is kind of unheard of in a law enforcement agency. Uh, the third thing is you have a government vehicle. So not only do they pay you, but they provide you a car too and you use it for official duty. So I drive home with my vehicle, I drive to work, I drive to interviews, I use it for moving surveillance, uh, anything in uh, to advance your official duties. Now we drive unmarked police vehicles. We also, uh, so we drive unmarked police vehicles. My personal vehicle, uh, my personal work vehicle is a, a Hyundai Sonata. So you would never guess in a million years if you saw me driving down in a Hyundai Sonata, maybe on the freeway or outside your neighborhood that I'm a federal law enforcement officer that I might be doing surveillance. Uh, so I have people in my office that drive SUVs, that drive chargers. Um, I have some people who go undercover and they have luxury vehicles, uh, Porsches, Mercedes, Ferraris, uh, you name it. Uh, there's lots of different vehicles. And I, 10 years in, I. I've had in, I've had quite a few vehicles. So that's very nice that the government uh, gives you a vehicle and pays for its gas as well. Uh, the fourth one, <clears throat> it's one of the best benefits is the pension and the early retirement. So again, for a government job, you get, uh, after you retire, you get guaranteed income until you die. So that gives people a lot of peace of mind. 
that they'll have uh, income for after they, they stop working. And also early retirement. We could retire as law enforcement officers as early as 50 in retirement at age 57. So social security, what you have to work to 65 or 66 now, imagine uh, being able to retire almost a decade early at age 50. Uh, so that's a huge, that's a huge benefit to be able to, to retire early. I can retire early and my kids well, we'll probably not even be in high school yet. So it's uh, an amazing option. Also, number four, uh, you have a professional salary, or number five, uh, there's a professional salary involved. When I graduated uh, from grad school and I became a social worker here in Los Angeles, I didn't make a lot of money, which was okay because that wasn't what I was looking for. I really wanted to work with kids and help my community and it was fine. Uh, but when I switched over to the special agent job, the federal agent job, it's on a federal pay scale and um, I made quite a bit more money. Uh, you can easily make within a few years, especially if you hit the journeyman level. When you become a special agent, you start at GS5. That's our base level. That's just with a bachelor's degree. And if you have uh, good grades and you have a 3.0 GPA or higher, then you might come in as a GS7. So you do the same work, five and seven, same work, but you get paid just a little more because you had that 3.0 GPA uh, in college or in your undergrad. Now, if you have a master's degree, uh, like I had when I got hired, you come in as a GS9. So five, seven, nine are our entry level uh, points for the special agent position here with IRS CI. And all three of those are, are entry point, and then you go from nine to 11 to 12 and 13, GS 13, that's where you wanna be. That's where you become a senior special agent and you become an independent agent. Uh, you don't have a mentor that you have to work with that you can work your own cases, get a lot of freedom. And that's also when you get the huge pay bumps. Uh, I believe right now GS 13, we top out at about 160, $165,000 uh, right now. So you do make a professional salary. And um, last but not least, it's just a really fun job. Uh, I haven't even started telling you what the job is, but it's super fun. Every day is different. Um, on Monday, you know, with before the pandemic hit, on Monday, I could be going to the shooting range because we have training or firearms qualification. On Tuesday, I could put on a suit and be down at the U.S. Attorney's Office or the courthouse because there's some sort of trial preparation that I need to be doing for my case. Uh, on Wednesday, I could be in jeans because I'm going to be out in surveillance all day, or I could be uh, doing some undercover work so I could be dressed down a little more. Um, on Thursday, I could be in business casual clothes because I'm coming to the office because I need to look at my files. I need to do some document analysis, a spreadsheet analysis, uh, make some phone calls. And then Friday, decide, do you need to go back out into the field, maybe conduct some interviews or do some surveillance or is there an enforcement action, all hands on deck, we're gonna make an arrest that day, we're gonna do a search warrant, we're gonna do a seizure. Again, every day is different um, and it's fun. So uh, IRS, when most people think about IRS, they think about uh, taxes because every year taxes are due in April and they think about being audited. 90% uh, or more of IRS is a civil component and criminal investigation is a law enforcement arm of IRS. And that's actually a very little known uh, department or division. Not many people know that there is law enforcement part of the IRS and uh, that we're law enforcement officers, that uh, we carry guns and that we arrest people and that we conduct surf warrants and raids. So. Uh, it's kind of exciting to tell you a bit about it, but a bit about our history. We were created on July 1st, 1919, and we were called the IRS Intelligence Unit. The first uh, squad or group was six agents. It was a group of six agents and were led by a man named Elmer Lincoln IRA. Now, uh, the IRS unit, Intelligence Unit, was started in 1919, but we didn't gain any kind of um, 
any kind of public acknowledgement or fame until the 1930s. And what really brought the intelligence unit onto the map in the 1930s was two big cases. One is uh, the Lindbergh kidnapping. So Charles Lindbergh was a famous American aviator and uh, sadly his baby was kidnapped. And uh, when he was kidnapped, the IRS intelligence unit came onto the scene and they were able to trace the serial numbers on the currency that was paid to the kidnappers in order to locate the kidnappers. Uh, unfortunately, when, you know, they found the kidnappers, but unfortunately the baby uh, was also found dead, but <clears throat> that case put the intelligence unit on the map and in front of the public's eye. And also the, it also showed the uh, extreme importance of uh, following the money and and having specialized law enforcement agents to be able to do that kind of work. Now, the other case that made us famous in the 30s was um, Al Capone, Al Capone case. Uh, Al Capone was a famous American mobster in Ch the Chicago area, and he was involved in murder and racketeering and a whole bunch of other things. And unfortunately, it was very difficult to get enough evidence to charge him with all those kind of things. But it was the intelligence unit, uh, the IRS intelligence unit that gathered the evidence to finally charge Al Capone with tax evasion uh, from all the, the money <laughs> that he had gathered in his criminal enterprise. Because again, all money is taxable, whether it's legal income or from your job or it's illegal income like from drugs or racketeering. So the intelligence unit finally gathered enough evidence to charge Al Capone with tax evasion. He went to court and he was convicted of it and he was ultimately jailed um, at Alcatraz. So those are the two cases that put us on the map in our early history. In 1978, the IRS changed its name to, uh, from the intelligence unit to IRCI. And up until that point, most of our legal authority was to charge tax related cases, tax fraud, tax evasion. Uh, but in the late 70s, our authority had expanded to include money laundering and to include uh, Bank Secrecy Act violations. So basically what this means is we're still financial investigators and these are just more financial crimes and having to deal with like money crimes and money violations. Uh, one of the things that we're most proud about, proud about is our conviction rate. And as you can see, since 1919, our conviction rate for tax crimes has never fallen below 90% we have the highest conviction rate in federal law enforcement. And this is important because we are criminal investigators, but what we do once we gather the evidence is we present it to the U.S. Attorney's Office and the U.S. Attorneys know that we are premier financial investigators and they want to work with us. And they take our cases and they prosecute our cases. Uh, we're very well respected in federal law enforcement circles and at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, we also like to partner up with other agencies. So because we work kind of a na more narrow set of tax crimes and financial crimes, we sometimes pair up with FBI agents and the FBI will charge um, murder or they'll charge a wire fraud or mail fraud. And we will charge the money crimes part of it like tax evasion or money laundering. Okay, so CI today, uh, as you can see from the chart, CI is a federal is part of a federal agency. We are part of the Department of the Treasury, but we also have an international footprint. So for any of you out there who love to travel and uh, see new places and or have ever thought about living outside the US, we have offices in 10 different countries and uh, we have attaches and deputy attaches stationed there. Uh, we also, if you can see in Washington DC, we also have our headquarters in Wash placed in Washington, D.C. because again, we're a federal agency. Now, uh, one of the things, let me see, Panama City, one of the guys that I went to my, the academy with uh, was my friend. He was recently named the deputy attache in Panama City and he loves it. Uh, another example, Sydney, Australia there. Uh, in one of my cases, I was able to work with the deputy attache that's in Sydney because I had a case um, involving a person in California who had bribed officials in, in Australia so that he could attain a hundred million dollars. And during, my invest during the course of my investigation, the two people in Sydney, Australia decided 
they wanted to come talk to IRS to, to talk to uh, the prosecutors from California and cooperate, and maybe work out a plea deal. They kind of wanted to confess basically to their part of the crime. So I was able to travel from Los Angeles with uh, my assistant U.S. attorney, and we flew out to Sydney, Australia to interview these two people. Uh, we were there for uh, over a week. And the first guy that we spoke with uh, was really great. He cooperated. He admitted to his part in the fraud and in the scheme. And uh, it was a very productive uh, meeting and interview. Uh, but the second guy that we were scheduled to meet with, uh, him and his attorney, uh, had backed out at the last minute and decided, you know what, I, I don't want to cooperate. I think uh, I'm going to take my chances in court. And that was his choice. And so we didn't get to speak to him. But I was still able to travel to Australia to hang out for over a week. Um, I used a diplomatic passport. Uh, the government had paid for my trip and my hotel room and I got per diem. So I got paid on a daily basis for uh, money for food and other expenses. So it was a wonderful trip and a wonderful opportunity to travel. Uh, you can see we also have uh, offices in London and Frankfurt. Again, I have an agent and a friend in my office here in Long Beach that uh, has an international case right now and he travels to London and Amsterdam all the time. Uh, and for Asia, if you're interested in Asia, we have an office in Hong Kong and they take care of any cases in, the, in you know, that area. Okay. So now back stateside, uh, again, we're a federal agency, so we cover the US and we're split our agencies into four, um, four areas, Western, Mid-States, Northern, and Southern. As you can see, Los Angeles is part of the Western area. Uh, another very popular office uh, that's part of the Los Angeles field office is Hawaii. So we also have an office in Hawaii. I had a friend, he retired about a year ago. He was part of the Southern area and he was based in the Virgin Islands. So those, again, those are some places that you could be posted. Um, one of the things when I spoke with HR they mentioned that when you apply, if you're interested in the special agent job, you're gonna get a list of all our openings across the country and across all the field offices. And you're going to be able to rank those lists of places that you wanna be, kind of a top 10 list. And CI, what they do is they really try to place you within the needs of the agency. So um, luckily for us in Los Angeles, we're one of the largest field offices and it's Los Angeles, New York, and Miami. So with those three offices, they're pretty large. We handle a lot of, of criminal investigations. And so if you wanna work in any of those offices and you put that on your list to be placed, uh, you have a really good shot of being placed there. Also in Los Angeles, because we call it a target rich environment, there's a lot of criminal crime that originates from here or from California or Southern California you could be here your whole career if you want. So if you have a large family and a large footprint in LA and want to settle here, that's great. Uh, you can be here your whole career. Other agencies like to rotate you to uh, different states or different offices. Uh, but here in LA, you're pretty much guaranteed to stay here your career if you want. In addition, uh, you, can also, you can also move around. So you're not necessarily married to your post of duty, to your city that you've been assigned to. After a couple of years or, you know, something may come up and you can ask for a voluntary transfer. So for example, I had a friend who uh, graduated from the academy and was assigned to Los Angeles and was here for about a year. And then she got married and her husband uh, was in Hawaii. So she asked for a voluntary transfer in Hawaii. It was a bit of a process, but they approved the transfer and now she's in Hawaii. Uh, so again, you have a lot of options to, uh, a lot of places to work and a lot of options. Now, one of the things that HR told me, when you make your list and you say your top 10, please make sure your top five are places that you are willing to actually live and work. Because if you are offered a position and if you are offered a placement and uh, you don't take it, it's not that they can't give you another, they, they can't really give you another location. It's not that easy because they're really trying to balance all the other offers they're getting. And it's really disappointing when you go through a process that's pretty extensive. And then at the end you're like, oh no, I really didn't want to live over there. 
Um, so please uh, make those decisions and that ranking um, very seriously. And, okay, so uh, again, we're spread out over 25 field offices. Uh, in Los Angeles, uh, our SAC, or Special Agent Charge, is the highest ranking agent in Los Angeles, and he sits in downtown LA. We also have uh, an office actually in San Bernardino. Uh, we have offices in Santa Ana. I work here in the federal building in Long Beach. Uh, that's where I'm here today in our conference room. Uh, we also have offices in, um, in Orange County. So we have offices at the federal building in Laguna Niguel, and we have offices down in San Diego. So there's quite a mix of offices. Our office that's the furthest north of our territory so we go all the way down from San Diego and all the way up to Santa Maria. Um, I was acting manager earlier in the year in Camarillo. So there's quite a few places uh, that you can stay in, uh, that you can live in and you can work in. So we're organized, again, the SAC is at the highest. And then here in LA, we have three ASACs that assist them. And then we're organized into different groups or so our offices are called groups. Um, and other federal agencies, the, the offices or groups are called squads, but I'm in the Long Beach group and in Long Beach, we have 10 agents. We have one supervisory special agent and then nine working special agents. Um, and as a special agent, you can be part of the computer investigative cadre uh, that they teach you investigative skills for the computer and how to extract information. Uh, they also, there's also other specialized groups uh, that you can join like drug groups or cyber crime groups. Uh, so there's all sorts of different things that you can be a part of in different cases that you can work. Uh, but working in a criminal investigation, a financial investigation, it's, it's complex and it takes a team effort. And part of that team are the invest intelligence analysts, the tax fraud investigative assistance and the compliance support assistance. So the IAs, the TFIAs, and the CSAs, they're invaluable help. And again, if you go to irs.gov, you can see all the jobs. So if you're not interested in a law enforcement position, there are other positions in the IRS that are non-law enforcement that you can also take a look at. And IRS is such a large employer that we're hiring all the time, at least for those other non-law enforcement positions. So our mission statement, if you go to our website or if you look up any of our brochures, is to serve the American public by investigating potential criminal violations of the Internal Revenue Code and related financial crimes. What does this mean? That basically means that we're the only law enforcement agency that's allowed to, that's authorized to um, charge tax charges or tax evasion charges. And since we also deal with related financial crimes, we're basically the money investigators or financial investigators. So any crime with a nexus or connection to money, we can be on the case. So uh, there was a murder case that I helped with uh, last year. And again, IRS, CI, we can't charge murder, but this person got money for the murder. And so I was able to come onto the case to trace the money, follow the money and charge money laundering, uh, money laundering charges. Now, our areas of focus, the priorities for IRS change every year. It comes down from headquarters, from the chief. Uh, but this just kind of gives you a smattering of some of the things that you could potentially get involved in. So again, we're the IRS, we deal in taxes. So there's employment tax fraud. Uh, when you get paid, if you look at your paycheck, there's all these little taxes taken out, FICA, FUCA, um, the med Medicare taxes, medical tax. So some employers, they'll take out the taxes and instead of paying them over to the federal government uh, on your behalf as they should, they keep it for themselves. And uh, that's employment tax fraud. So we, we prosecute those crimes. There's also the international tax fraud or any fraud with an international nexus and money. Um, I told you earlier about my case in Sydney uh, where I had to fly to Sydney, that was, um, that was a bribery case where somebody, again, bribed people to, to obtain $100 million in their fraud. Uh, but again, I'm working a new uh, fraud case right now with an international nexus, in which case this woman embezzled from her company and a lot of the company investors were people in China. So there's an international connection there. 
Uh, we'll see how that pans out. Uh, abusive tax schemes. So again, those are people who don't really want to pay their fair share of taxes, and they try to find the loopholes uh, in the tax code. And some of these loopholes are legal, and some of them are illegal. And uh, we have quite a bit of those to sort out. Refund crimes. Cure P is questionable rule, refund fraud, or PP, return prepare fraud, and identity theft. So this last category here used to be the bread and butter of IRS CI. We did a lot of these cases. Uh, return preparer fraud basically is when uh, you go to the return preparer like H&R Block or some other independent person. They put a lot of you know, false things on your tax return so you get a bigger, um, a bigger tax refund. So some of our undercover work, I'm part of the undercover shopping program. And basically what we do is during tax season, we go out to different uh, tax preparation businesses uh, that we've gotten tips about and we get our tax returns prepared. Uh, sometimes I walk in there just you know, with nothing, no paperwork, no W-2, no nothing. I sit down and they say, hey, uh, can you please do my taxes? And they're like, well, where's your paperwork? And I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't really have anything. Um, I was a dog walker and um, I just kind of got paid, you know, cash by some people. But I heard that if you file taxes, um, you know, that, that you can get a good refund. And I heard that you're the place to go. And they're like, Okay, hold on. Let me let me you know let me do something on the computer here. And boom, um, I think we can get you five ten thousand dollars. How does that sound? And I'm like, that sounds great. So, I think we know we deal you know, with those kind of frauds. The fraud referral program. Um, this is something that the IRS is always developing. We get fraud referrals from our IRS civil division. So I told you about ninety percent of the IRS is a, a civil program where they, we do audits and that's the one, the people that deal with the, the, tax, uh, the taxes that you have to submit in April every year. Well, the revenue agents that work for the uh, IRS civil side, sometimes when they see something egregious, then they refer it over to our side. But we also take referrals from outside of the IRS. Um, these are what I call the X factor. So we get tips from your ex-spouse, ex-wife, ex-husband, ex-friend, ex-neighbor, so just about anywhere. And I have an example of a party. So my uh, one of my cases, the, one of the US attorneys was at a party here in Los Angeles. And just like at any party, she was sitting next to somebody and she didn't know and they started chatting. And one of the things that came up was, hey, what do you do for work? And my friend said, oh, I'm an assistant US attorney. I'm a prosecutor. I prosecute uh, white collar crimes, fraud crimes. And uh, her companion at the dinner table was like, oh, you know, um, I work for a really big company and somebody at the company uh, was accused of embezzling money, uh, a lot of money from the company. Is that something that you would prosecute? Is that something you look into? And she was like, that's exactly uh, what we would look into. So she gave him his card and she said, give, you know, contact me if you want to, you know, tell us a tip about this situation. So he did contact her and uh, she's a prosecutor. She doesn't do the investigations. So she referred him to me and I contacted with him. I contacted him about his tip and followed up. And he's now a whistleblower who gave information about this. And uh, we have a program in the IRS that if you give a tip on something, and we successfully prosecute and get restitution or some sort of money out of it, you can get a portion of that. Of course, your portion for giving us this tip is after we pay restitution to the victims. So in this case, um, this woman worked at the company. It's a, a large, well-known company here in the area. And uh, she had been embezzling from the company for years. Basically, her fraud was that she would write checks, uh, she would write invoices to say, oh, um, this company provided these kind of services. Would you pay this bill? You know, would you pay this $10,000 bill? Would you pay this $50,000 bill? And since it's a big company and she worked in that division that kind of pays out these expenses, they just wrote the checks and wrote them to her. But she was basically making fake invoices so that they would pay this company and Basically, she was the company, so she would go and cash those checks and use those checks to throw a $20,000 first birthday party for her, her child in Malibu. Um, so this went on actually for a few years. She was pretty good at her fraud. Uh, and what finally gave her away is uh, she got pregnant and went on maternity leave. 
And when she went on maternity leave, her replacement saw that there were these additional invoices and said, hey, what company is this? Uh, why are we paying them? This doesn't look familiar. And that kind of blew a lid on the, the fraud in their company. And then um, we got called in. It was funny though, because uh, there were two tips that came out. So there was somebody in the company, once this was uncovered, decided to call the FBI and say, hey, we had somebody who's been uh, embezzling from us, right? That's an embezzlement charge. Uh, can you please look into this? And there may be criminal, um, criminal charges. And then they, um, um, and then of course a secondary tip came from a guy who worked at the company who told the US att assistant US attorney who then told me. So cyber crimes is another thing. Uh, we're dealing with virtual currency, uh, frivolous ar arguments program. These are the people who don't believe that they need to pay taxes and that they're sovereign citizens and they exist by a whole different set of rules. Um, public and political corruption. So any kind of corruption or things that harm the public good. Uh, one of our current examples of that is Operation Varsity Blues. I don't know if you heard about it in the news, but there are basically these parents that uh, bribed uh, a man named, uh, I think it was Alex Singer, and he uh, helped get their children into select universities like uh, USC or Stanford by saying that their kids were part of the rowing crew or the, um, the tennis club or these other sports that they didn't play. But basically, they, he facilitated bribes to get kids into the college of their choice. Then there's money laundering charges. Um, I recently had a case, it was a murder case. And again, the IRS doesn't charge murder. Uh, that's out of our house, we do financial crimes. But uh, in this case, the man um, took out life insurance policies on his wife and kids, uh, and then he tried to murder them for the money. Um, unfortunately, he was successful uh, with the kids, uh, unsuccessful with the wife, the wife survived. And he was able to gain insurance proceeds from their deaths. And what I did as part of the case is the, I followed the money and, um, and I was able to gather evidence to charge money laundering. My FBI counterpart, um, for whatever reason in the case, a lot of complicated reasons with the US Attorney's Office, he couldn't charge murder, but uh, he was able to charge insurance fraud. And one of the exciting things um, that happened in this case is we went to trial in October and at trial, it was a couple of weeks, uh, the subject was found guilty on all counts. And he was supposed to be sentenced uh, in March, but then COVID hit, the pandemic hit. And so the courts were closed, but I'm looking forward to the courts opening back up because then we're gonna have um, sentencing. And this subject is looking at about 200 years in prison. So I'm excited to see what the judge meets out for justice and I'm excited to see justice done. And then we also have uh, drug cases as part of the OCDEF, uh, Organized Crime Task Force. I'm gonna skip through some of these because I wanna make sure that we get to uh, the how to apply part of this um, and have time for questions. So again, as a federal agent, as a special agent, I've been using those words interchangeably, but we are criminal financial investigators just uh, because of the agency that we work for. And we follow the money on tax crimes, money laundering, asset forfeiture. One of the things right now, I'm working on a case where this woman embezzled a couple million dollars from her company and uh, took $2 million and uh, she bought a house that she lives in now. Uh, she bought it cash. And if I can get evidence and connect the embezzlement fraud to the house, I might be able to seize the house. So I'm excited about that angle and I'm gonna see where the evidence leads. But once you conduct your investigation, you gather all the evidence that you can, you're just an investigator. Then you have to bring it over and present your findings to the U.S. Attorney's Office. And the U.S. Attorney's Office will determine the charges that they'll charge and uh, you know, determine if they're gonna pick up your case. And you're competing against a lot of other agencies like the FBI who brings their cases, um, Homeland Security, postal inspection. So there's a lot of cases that are being brought to the U.S. Attorney's Office, but not all of them get prosecuted. And so the reputation of CI is important in helping our cases get prosecuted because we are known for having uh, really great and solid cases with good evidence. Okay, so let's get to the meat of this. For hiring qualifications, uh, there are a couple of basic requirements. You have to be a U.S. citizen, and just uh, rule number one. 
Uh, but number two, there's an age requirement. You have to be 37 or under at the time of certification. The main reason for this is you need to put in 20 years of service in order to get the pension um, at retirement. And we have a mandatory retirement date at 57. So if you're 40 and you try to come on board, you won't be able to put in 20 years before you have to retire at 57. So 37 plus 20 years of service is 57. So that's the oldest that you can be. Um, next, you have to have a bachelor's degree. This is the exciting part. And like I told you before, I, had, I was a history major for undergrad. I had a counseling major for grad school. You can be any major. You can be an art major. You can be a music major. You can be an accounting major. Uh, you can have um, a criminology major. You can be any major. We need people of all shapes and sizes, of all stripes, um, you know, of all backgrounds. Uh, we need you. As long as it's supplemented by 15 semester hours of accounting and nine semester hours of related fields, such as finance, business law, tax law, economics. So again, as an Asian history major, a Japanese history major, um, I didn't have these classes. So I had to supplement my classes. I went to the local community college and I took some accounting classes. Um, some of my um, general, uh, general units counted uh, as the related field units. So uh, take a look at your transcripts and see if you can put together um, these necessary hours if you're not already an accounting major or a tax, uh, tax major or law major. Okay, you also have to have the ability to work anywhere in the US. Um, again, you saw our post of duties, but really we hire for the needs of the agency. Um, and this is important, the very, you must be able to carry a firearm and you must be willing to carry a firearm. So this is a law enforcement position. Um, you do law enforcement uh, activities such as arresting people, uh, searches, search warrants, uh, raids, seizures of, of property. So you have to be willing to uh, become a law enforcement officer and all that entails. And you have to have a valid driver's license because again, uh, you're given a, an undercover vehicle or an unmarked police car to drive. So the pre-employment process is extensive. The main four main things are you have to be able to pass a drug test. You have to pass a medical exam that we administer, uh, a background investigation, and of course a pre-employment tax check and audit because you do work for the IRS. Now, there's a lot of words on this slide. I'm not gonna go through all of it because it is on our website, but the two things here that are in bold are the most important things for the medical requirements. So you have to be able to pass a hearing test. Part of that is officer safety because you'll be, uh, you'll be operating a firearm. And there's also a vision test. As you can see, I wear glasses. Um, so as long as you can correct your vision to certain parameters, you're fine. Uh, some agents have also had LASIK, you'll be fine. Uh, but again, the vision test is because you're a law enforcement officer and you'll be carrying a firearm and there's officer safety issues involved. CITP, so when you're hired after applying, you have six months of training. Now, the six months of training is at FLETC, the uh, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. And when you're there, uh, you'll be paid your salary and you'll also be housed by the US government. So it's kind of a basic training for special agents or federal agents. The first two months, about nine weeks, is the CITP Criminal Investigator Training Program. It's kind of like basic training for uh, criminal investigators. So as you can see, they'll teach you about criminal law, about you know what it takes to arrest a person, what kind of evidence you need, um, courtroom procedures, enforcement actions, how do you arrest someone, uh, defensive tactics, how to protect yourself, interviewing, basic interviewing, and of course, firearms, because it is a law enforcement position. Uh, the next four months, of your training is called the SABT, and that's again uh, at FLETC, and that's a special agent basic training. And this is the agency specific training. You kind of split off from the rest of the other agencies that you might have been working with in CITP, and you're with your class, your academy class is about 25 agents, and they teach you basically how to be an IRS special agent. They instruct you in tax law, criminal law. Again, I was a history major masters in counseling, I knew nothing about taxes, nothing about accounting, and they teach you all you need, the basics at least, at the academy for six months. And after you graduate from the academy and you come back to your POD, your post of duty, that's when you're assigned a mentor 
and you become, um, you do your on the job training. So you're an, you're an OJT on job trainee, and then you have an OJI and on the job instructor. And they're going to um, partner with you on some more basic cases until you get your feet wet and kind of get to know what you're doing and how to run your own investigation. And they say it takes about two to five years to learn to be a special agent. So there is quite a steep learning curve, but it's going to be an awesome two to five years. So the good news is, as I told you at the very beginning, IRSCI is hiring right now. There's about 3,500 uh, CI employees and about 2,000 of those are special agents. We need people right now. We're hiring over 200, so we're hiring about 10% more to add to our ranks. And we want you, we want to have a diverse workforce. We want to have people to uh, speak different languages. Uh, you know, we need people so that we can send them and, and talk and do investigations in different communities. So if you haven't thought of law enforcement as I had not, um, it's okay. You know, you can try this out and see if this is a fit for you. Uh, so we're hiring and the way to apply is you have to go to www.usajobs.gov. So you um, register on there, you open up the application and you go through the process. I believe you have to submit your resume. There's other documents that you have to submit. So if you're going to say that, you know, you um, qualify because of some accounting units and classes, you have to uh, upload your transcripts, that kind of thing. And this announcement will only be open through November 2020. And after that, I don't know when we're going to hire again. Um, and just so you know, again, CI special agents were a very specialized group of agents. There's about 2000 of us across the country. And just to give you some comparison, the FBI, those are the people um, most famous for being federal agents, or that's the agency that Americans are most familiar with. The, AG, the FBI is the agency with the largest amount of agents, and they have about 13,000 uh, special agents and about 20,000 kind of in their support professional roles. Um, but again, we're 2,000. And here in the LA area, Southern California area, there's about 200 of us. So you really get to know your colleagues, and it is us uh, like a family. Uh, so in the process, it's a three-phase process to get hired, uh, just so you know with this graphic. Phase one is the application on USA Jobs. If you go through phase one and you pass and all the documents check out, then there's phase two. It's an unproctored uh, job preview and job simulation questions. So these are mostly uh, multiple choice questions with one or two, I believe, open-ended questions. And then phase three of the uh, application process is a proctored exam. Again, more um, the knowledge and skills exam is more uh, multiple choice questions, but there's also a writing sample and assessment. So those are a little more extensive. Now phase two would take you about an hour, hour and a half um, online. And then phase three will take you about three hours. And if you get through that and you pass the phase three, then you'll be eligible for selection. And then uh, once they tell you uh, what post of duty that you might be at, then they start the interview process. And after the interview, if the SAC and the panel selects you, then you'll be made an offer. Uh, this whole process uh, takes a little under a year. And right now our HR, our human resources department uh, doubled and they're trying to get it down to six months. But you can see while this is happening, the three different phases, they're also trying to do a background check on you. They're also sending you to the doctor for the physical exam. Uh, there's also the drug test. So there's a lot going on in the next six months, 12 months. And what we say in the federal government is, you know, hurry up, hurry up and get your documents in, make sure you don't miss deadlines. And then you wait. You got to be patient because it is a process. Uh, what I tell everybody who's interested in a government career um, and not just CI is don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you're interested in several agencies, apply to different agencies and, and see what shakes out because the process can be quite lengthy and extensive. And please do not quit your job if you currently have one right now until you get an offer letter from the IRS. Because if you, if you think, oh, I've made it through phase two, 
nothing's a guarantee until you get that offer letter until they say hey it's time for you to go to the academy and even when you get the offer letter uh, let's just say you get it in March. Well, they have to wait for a spot at the training center, the federal training center to open up to send you to the academy. Because again, all the other federal agencies are sending their special agents to that academy. And we have to fight for spaces. And they might say, oh, well, you know what? We've hired you, but you won't be able to go to the academy until June. So there's that six months. You know, what are you going to do in that six months? Don't quit your job yet. Uh, keep going on until it's time to go to the academy. So uh, I'm down to my last slide. Sorry, I think I went over a little bit. I wanted to leave time for questions. But if you want additional information, there's a couple of website addresses. Always good is irs.gov. And from there, there's a jobs link, or you could go to jobs.irs.gov. And you could look at the special agent job or the law enforcement division job. But there's tons of other links for the other civil jobs. If you go to YouTube, we also have a special agent video. It's posted by our, our official handle, IRS videos. Um, there's about two videos there. The link I put in the PowerPoint is kind of a two minute special agent video, but there's a longer 11 minute video that you can watch on your own time and kind of gauge if, if this is for you. Um, again, this is my contact info. I used to be the lead recruiter in uh, Los Angeles, but I stepped down uh, last year because I just got too busy, uh, but I still love recruiting. And I love um, interacting with uh, people that are interested. So feel free to email me and I can give you tips or give you updates on the process. And uh, there's also, if you go to the IRS website, there is a phone number you can call and the recruiters, there's a recruitment cadre and um, they might go to one of four different people um, or you could reach me directly at this um, at email address. Um, I don't wanna give out my phone number at this time, partly because with the COVID, we're not exactly at our desks. So uh, email is the best way to get a hold of me at this time. 